Mr. Paul Lehman is the Vice President and Head of Dermal and Transdermal Research at QPS LLC. And today he is going to talk to us about um, IVPT outliers, anomalous and aberrant data, and some of the examples that has been observed in some of um, uh, some of the studies that he has been a part of. Uh, it's three basic portions to my presentation. Uh, first, I'll talk about outliers or anomalous data examples. Uh, I'll spend a little, a couple of minutes on those pesky zero values that occasionally crop in, and then spend a little bit of time talking about uh, JMAX and the, the problems that it can produce depending on, on your study design. Now, the foundation for outliers. It's really uh, something that everyone in our field has encountered at some point where a given skin section or chamber gives entirely unusual or different results than all the other replicates. But I want to make sure we differentiate those that are highly improbable versus those that are natural extremes. These are the highly improbable ones that cause us most problems in understanding on what to do with them. And they fall into basically three categories. Uh, there's a single sample time point within a flux profile. There's uh, an example where a flux profile is entirely different from the replicates. And the third being is uh, the time course of permeation, that is the T max, is entirely different from the replicates. And what I'd like to do is show you examples of each and give discussion points. Uh, what may be the options on dealing with them, but I don't have the answers uh, on how to deal with them. And that's where I think the statisticians and the panel group can uh, bring some insight. Now, FDA's current opinions, at least uh, they keep telling me this, is that in general, the agency does not recommend excluding data from a bioequivalent study analysis without documented protocol violations. And the difference is that a document violation is typically one that you actually observed occur or can be traced to a uh, audit trail, uh, or there is some other written evidence uh, that indicates that there was a protocol deviation or violation that is causing that data point or that skin section to be different from the other replicates. It's the undocumented activities or functions that are the problem, uh, particularly with skin, in that um, you may have incorrectly put your samples in the, in the analytical tray and not realize it, or there's a power fluctuation, or uh, there's damage to the skin while you're dosing it, uh, or most likely physiological differences in stratum corneum as no two skin sections are identical and the same, that there you could have side-by-side -side skin sections with entirely different uh, permeation uh, characteristics. And these are just top of the head, uh, sort of uh, undocumented uh, occurrences. And I'm sure you could come up with a much longer list than, than I have here. Uh, the data is being presented, came from well-controlled design studies where we can generally make the assumption that it was not the conduct that caused uh, the problem or the unusual data, that it's related to the, uh, the skin itself or the product. Frequency, uh, this is what we've seen in the frequency of occurrence of outliers uh, in nine different studies, uh, some with similar drugs, the same drug, that there have been uh, outliers that uh, have been observed, but they only account for 1 to 2% of, of uh, the replicates. But the fact that 4 out of 9 studies had outliers, it's, that's nearly 50% of the time you have to deal with uh, the situation of what to do with that outlier. And these would be considered statistically different from the other replicates. What would the, the potential of that, of including those outliers 
or anomalous data in the PE uh, statistical evaluation could influence the outcome of the results, particularly if all the outliers are in one of the test article, but not in the other. Now, anecdotally, this may be relevant or not, don't know yet, is that um, two studies had, had outliers of the same drug, but another two studies did not have outliers with, the, with these two being the same drug. So could the, it be more likely to have outliers with certain formulations or certain degrees of permeation? Uh, it's insufficient data to uh, support that, but it's interesting to know. <clears throat> this is the first example. A single data point stands out from the crowd. And it's very clearly an outlier from the other replicates. This is most likely uh, either a sampling error or an analytical issue. And certainly by reviewing the study records, the audit trails, the log books, you may be able to identify uh, what caused this one sample to be anomalous. If not, what do you do with it? Example two can uh, come in two different formats. These are replicates within a donor. The time profile is nearly identical to all the other replicates, but it's clearly two, three fold higher. So its AUC is dramatically different. And its GA max is dramatically different. So uh, different AUC and different J max, but the same profile. Here's a different profile with a different J max and different AUC. This may be a consequence of damage of the uh, of the barrier during dose application, or maybe just that this bigger skin section had uh, more pores or uh, a invisible damage not picked up by uh, the integrity test. The third example is where you may have a, a similar AUC and JMAX, but again, the profile penetration is very different. If you look at just the uh, raw values for AUC and JMAX it, uh, for replicate number four, they don't stand out from the others. But as you can clearly see, the profile is entirely different. Should this be considered an outlier or anomalous skin section? And should it be included uh, when all the other replicates are relatively similar? And then it gets even more complicated where you might have more than one uh, chamber section that is anomalous and has an entirely different penetration profile uh, from the other replicates. Uh, there are two very low uh, rates of permeation uh, versus a, a, a well-shaped uh, profile for the other replicates. Here are two that stand out dramatically with very different G max uh, than the other profiles. Another consideration would be is are low values just as relevant uh, to be considered as outliers as high values. Well, I already mentioned what the FDA's uh, opinion in general is. Uh, they have commented back to me on, on IVPT that they do not currently have specific recommendations uh, for identifying what an outlier is and what to do with it, but they're they're currently studying the matter, and I think uh, it will be a valuable uh, portion of the panel discussion to, to help flesh out what to do with these things. Uh, for example, how to objectively identify an anomalous data point. Uh, we can't just say oh, I don't like it. We have to have some rational, objective way of identifying it, either by magnitude or in a statistical evaluation. Does its, its removal or replacement require a scientific justification or just a statistical demonstration of difference? Uh, traditionally, we consider high outliers relevant as being potentially damaged integrity of the barrier or, 
or an anomaly to the barrier itself. Uh, but what about low outliers? Should the anomalous data be removed, replaced, or included? And what was what would be the influence on the outcome uh, if it whether it passes or passes with the outliers removed, but bioclones fails with their inclusion? And should the similar criteria that I'm talking about replicates be also applicable to donors or just keep it with the replicates within donor? Uh, just a few minutes on the zero values. Uh, I think the uh, statisticians will have much more to say about this. But certainly, it's primarily a function of analytical sensitivity. Uh, uh, you must be able to have uh, an adequate analytical method, uh, more and more often being uh, targeting using uh, mass spec, mass spec systems, to be able to quantify the low permeation of some of these products. It's much uh, less of an issue among replicates, but a, a significant issue. And there are one or more donors that show measurable, no measurable permeation due to, due to the log transformation required for uh, the bio equivalent analysis. So if in donor seven, for this particular formulation, all data is uh, below limits of detection, GMAX and AUC are undefined when the log transform. So what are the options? Do we just remove the donor seven from the calculations? Should we replace it with a geometric mean? Should we replace it with a lower limit of detection or lower limit of quantitation or some fraction thereof? Should it be disqualified and replaced with another donor? But what happens if there's no permeation uh, measurable from one formulation, but measurable for the other formulation. That adds another degree of complexity to the issue. Now to this JMAX. Uh, it can be elusive and poorly defined parameter. Uh, I've seen in some of the chat and some of the earlier discussion what to do about that first time point if it turns out to be JMAX. And you really can take samples before it to better define it. Well, here's a set of, uh, of data. Uh, and here's the original data where we took a two hour time point and JMAX did occur in that first time point. But taking earlier time points would have been below limits of detection, could not define it. But interesting anomaly to the uh, influence of the sampling schedule. If we had taken that first time point in four hours instead of at two, the same amount of drug would have been absorbed but over a four hour time point, flux drops and now is equivalent to this later point. If we had taken the sample at eight hours instead of at two or four, it drops further. And now we have a G max here and same thing if we did it at 12 hours. So the occurrence of that early time point I J max is influenced by the sampling collection uh, and, the, and the influence of, of the time duration. Now, this first original data may actually be a true representative of what happens in vivo, but complicates the issue if half your chambers show this high time point, the other half does not, because the, the truer representation of the penetration is this later GMAX. Uh, as was mentioned previously, so what do you do with data where you don't see a JMAX? Uh, you select the last data point and call that JMAX, but in fact, maybe one more sample would show that this is JMAX and it's dropping down, or is it continually rising thereafter? If we end up with a steady state, could we not use steady state as, as equivalent to JMAX? If it is discriminating between formulations, one option that's being used by several is to do a surface wash sometime at an earlier time point, removing the residual uh, applied dose and allowing then the, the elimination of the drug uh, by demonstrating decline in flux after the surface wash.
And then what Gmax do we use? There's uh, six replicates, flux time course for each one. And you can see Gmax uh, occurs four out of the six at, at the same time point, but for two at a different time point. If we were to average across, we end up with this Gmax of uh, 85 nanograms per square centimeter per hour. But if we take that uh, Gmax by chamber and bring it down and average just the Gmax values, we get an entirely different value. If we take that uh, first donor, plot them here, now we have a bunch of donors, and, and you can see that each donor has, uh, not each donor, but several donors have very different uh, Gmax occurrences and Tmax occurrences. Again, averaging across, you get one value based off the curves. If you bring in the donor value from the, from the donor mean curve, average it across, you get another mean value. Or if you take the what was in the previous slide, uh, the 88.059 value as the donor mean and average them across, you get a third value. Now, what this results in is that you can have potentially four different J max values, uh, depending on whether you're averaging across donors, within donors, across profiles or using the method uh, recommended in the guides uh, for establishing the geometric mean. So which is the correct GMAX to use and which one is the best representation of uh, the data itself? So that's a quick take on uh, outliers, zero values and GMAX. Uh, as a starting point uh, for discussion uh, based off the statistical presentation, that's going to be presented next and the panel discussion. That's all I have. Thanks.